Been missing out on cute. I won't be as angry as the last time, though, I promise. <laughs> Try not to be, at least. Okay, so we left off, and I told you, I'm going to go through each line on here and just ramble a little bit about what's where the source of error comes from, how to try to fix it, and then what to do, what happens if you don't. Um, note that I'm saying this, like the fix for it is not necessarily obtainable. Like obtainable, attainable, I don't even know that we know some of it. Um, especially the latter two. Like what do you do if you don't think your data is, are continuous and meet a normal distribution? Well, you could do IRT, but how do you know that fits that distribution? <laughs> All right, so it's it's at some point um, becomes harder and harder and harder to do. But again, it's it's in the, the process of outlining where the error is. I think that's so important to, to the use of these things, right? Yeah, you can use that, but here are some of the limitations to doing it. Some easy, some things are easy to fix, some aren't. But all of the following slides assume that no sum score analysis is used, right? That this factor score based analysis with imputation is kind of our starting point for the discussion. Alright? So, the first thing we had was measurement error. Oh, measurement error. Probably tired of me saying that. I'm tired of me saying that. Um, I'm about ready to go into hard sciences rather than you know, things with psychometrics. What I really need is some biology or chemistry or something. No, forget it. I love what I do. Um, to reduce measurement error, right, the, the only way to do so is to get more p items that are high quality on your test. Right? I showed you an example of three and five items. Not cool. Right? Measurement error, to reduce it, more and more and more and more and more items. Right? The closer you can get reliability to one, is the converse of measurement error, right? It's measurement precision. Um, so what are the ramifications of reducing measurement error? Uh, the lower your measurement error, the better the reliability is. It means you'll actually have better power to detect effects in simultaneous or non-simultaneous analyses. Um, you won't need as many imputation steps in an imputation analysis. The thing that you're imputing from, you can cover with a few values rather than having a wide range that you need to do. What do you need to do if the error is present, though? Right? If you have measurement error, you need some type of method that does multiple imputation or simultaneous analysis to control for it. The simultaneous analysis partitions measurement error. That's where the unique variances showed up. And in item response theory, if you or if you change the distribution a little bit, the error itself is still, it's hard to see where it is, but it's still partitioned. What are the uh, difficulties in reducing measurement error? Well, every item that you add makes model fit that much more difficult, right? It is very hard to get a 40 item scale to fit to measure one factor. gets even worse when we're in uh, non-normal. It's harder to assess fit. Yeah. So I think that's pretty cool, right? You want to get rid of measurement error? Add more items. But not just any items. Items that are high quality. All right, if you add items that are random noise with no information for the factor, measurement error is roughly the same. It doesn't do any good. Right. Questions? No. So that's hard to do, especially if you're using other people's scales. I get it, right? Because... You don't have any control over that. Uh, if you're developing your own scale for it, just keep that in mind. If you want the more reliability of people to use it, you have a longer version of it. It's very hard to get model fit. The other thing I find interesting is that we talk, as psychometricians, we talk about like you can come up with items as if they just randomly pop in your head. Developing the gambling scale really set me, I didn't really develop it, but I sat in the meetings of the people who did. Like, there's only so many ways you can ask if you've stolen money to finance your gambling. Right? There it is. Have you stolen before to go pay for gambling? Right? But that's just, there's only so many things. When you get into a topic area that you're interested in measuring, it's very hard to measure it uh, with certain items. Right? If you get into a very wide, wide, we talk about in, in each of the factors, uh, when I get into the, the work I do, we talk about um, measurement of things in terms of their grain size. Right? Gambling's very wide. 
uh, gambling criterion eight, which was has committed the legal act, illegal acts to pay for or to, to keep gambling. Um, that's very narrow. Um, the more narrow your topic area that you're trying to measure, the harder it is to create good items or a lot of them. All right. Math as a concept struct, very easy. Anything could be math, right? Uh, finding lowest common, denom common denominators, although easier than asking if people have stolen money to gamble, uh, still more narrow, but then you can plug in different numbers and so forth. All right, what about the factor score distribution error, right? That, that's a weird one, right? Because if you go and switch the factor score and you want to try to multiply impute or something like that, now all of a sudden the, fact, this, the distribution you assume about the factor score makes it squished into a normal. Um, believe it or not, the fix for reliability is still the same fix for, um, sorry, the fix for measurement error, unreliability, is the uh, fix for factor score distribution error. Uh, in Billy's Badass Bayesian class next year, you'll know that the prior itself is one piece of information. If you don't have a lot of data, then the prior is the thing that kind of focuses all the information to give you a number. Uh, data, the more data you have, the less the prior matters. And for a factor score, it's not data in terms of people, it's data in terms of items from the same person. All right, so more and more items makes that factor distribution less informative, or like makes the prior less informative. It weakens it quite a bit. Okay. And again, the same, with more items, you get the same series of things that show up in the next bulleted slides. Uh, if you reduce the type of error, you get uh, less, you get better reliability for the factor score, you get greater power, you get fewer need for m multiple imputation steps. Um, if you have this type of error, simultaneous analysis, really, I should just, I shouldn't say this right here. This should be simultaneous analysis. <laughs> you, simultaneous, I, I'm like delirious. I, I, I put a U there, it looked like an N because I can't draw or write, and then I thought I spelled it wrong. Anyway. Uh, simultaneous analysis is really the only way around for it because you don't actually provide a score for anything. You just, here's your analysis. It's not the only way you can fix it. Uh, and But the difficulties, if you are trying to reduce this difficulty, is the same thing as if you were trying to reduce unreliability or measurement error. More items means it's harder to achieve model fit. Okay, questions? What about sampling error? Well, we had sampling error in our analysis where we did the multiple imputation. And it's that idea that every factor score distribution that we're imputing from depends on our model parameters, and those depend on us having a large enough sample that they're stable, that they don't have a standard error to them. And if you really think about what we, uh, we need to, 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 to get rid of sampling error, we just need a larger sample size. Great. <laughs> Good luck, right? There, in some of the things that you might be measuring, there may not be a large sample size to be had, right? If you're measuring um, people's attitudes on, or you know, hardcore gamblers' attitudes on gambling or something, there's not that many pathological gamblers out there, right? It's very hard to have access to people. Um, but really, if you think about it, when we create a factor score, we're doing what I said was a problem, right? We said, oh wait, we're taking each factor loading and treating it like it didn't have error, right? We said, oh, we're gonna fix the factor loadings, we're gonna fix the unique variances, and we're gonna use them to come up with the distribution of factor score, when really all of those had error too. Oh my gosh, right, that's a problem. So, uh, some of the ramifications of reducing this error, we get better power for hypotheses, better stability of factor scores, fewer imputation steps needed. What happens if we, have this error is present, um, we can do multiple imputation, but the multiple imputation actually has to be done where all parameters are simultaneously imputed. And that falls under something called Markov chain Monte Carlo. All right, we're going to sample from our distribution of factor loadings, unique variances, because right? they're, they're flexible because we have all these people that 
I have very few people, so wide error to them. Get a value, a plausible value for factor loadings. Bless you. Plausible value for all unique variances. Then convert those, get a factor score distribution, get a plausible value for the factor. What? And that is that is a full on, that is a absolutely 100% true, tried and true Bayesian analysis. That is pure Bayesian statistics right there. All right, so the answer, and Billy and I agree on many things, but this is one where we probably uniformly agree almost entirely. We have a colleague who wants to write, how do we handle small sample sizes in his line of research in our department? And both of us simultaneously said Bayesian. Yeah, Bayesian analysis. So Bayesian is how you do it. So if you want to get a factor score, if you want to use that for later on, use a Bayesian analysis where the, the parameters are sampled and the, um, the factors are sampled. Now, Bayesian analyses aren't easy to come by yet again. I was going to show you this in M+. Plus. M+, plus doesn't do it the way they should be to make this work. So, it was very difficult to make this work, but the Bayesian analysis is becoming easier. Uh, it's not quite where it needs to be yet, but just give it a couple years. I'm telling you, this program I'm writing, no, it'll, it'll have its flaws too. God, it will have its flaws. And it'll kill me, right? Because then I, I've got no one to criticize but me. Dang it, Templin. I'll probably blame Megan Sullivan because she's sitting right up here. And that's that's what we do, right? We great blame the graduate research assistants. Is that how it works? No. Oh, gosh, no. no I guarantee you, uh, I'd love to have a program that, did this, that made it easy that you could just push a button and not think about it. And that's what I'm working toward. It's just I can't get there. So. Not yet. Hopefully there. And even when I get there, it still will never be done. There will still be errors. Okay, questions on sampling error? No. This ML bias error is an interesting one. Um, I serve, I have a, Lisa and I are co-chairing a committee. Uh, I guess I'm technically not co-chair, but that's because neither of us work there, so one of us, only one of us could be the chair. Anyway. There's a student at Nebraska, uh, the one and only admitted Megan was one that we when we, we when Lisa and I when I moved to Nebraska we had a quant program we started the quant program we admitted two people, Megan, and Ryan Walters. Megan moved down here. Ryan Walters was close to being finished, so he just stayed at Nebraska. Although he works full time at Creighton as a biostatistician. Um, point of this story is that on his he's doing a dissertation. He had a proposal defense, and it's involved it's involving a similar type of set of models um, with mo using maximum likelihood and normal assumptions. And in that defense, we have a fairly prominent uh, statistician on this committee, a guy by the name of Walt Stroop from Nebraska, not the Walt Stroop I talked about at Texas last week. And um, Walt's work is in mixed models. And um, in ML, I mentioned, you may remember this in these types of models, when we talked about estimation, the first thing I said in ML, we get a biased estimate of the variance, right? It's like using the formula for variance that divides the thing by n versus n minus 1. That's the type of estimator bias I'm talking about here. ML makes your variance is a little bit too small. So in small sample sizes, which I would say the vast majority of studies with psychometrics have, not that we see in education measurement, but in most research that we do, we have small sample sizes, that bias becomes rather large. Uh, and can affect a lot of the p-values that you go into your analysis. Um, so much so that it, if you look at other types of analyses, there's an analysis called residual maximum likelihood, or REML, that shows up, that is a way of using maximum likelihood but with a different target distribution, the distribution of the residuals, to make that bias go away. None of the psychometric packages we use incorporates REML, right? Not Levon, not M+. Uh, pick pick other SCM packages you've ever heard, Amos, um, Lizrul, all of the above. Any ML that we would write with uh, an estimator, uh, a Bayesian estimator would also do it. Uh, if you're in PROC, MCMC, and SAS, you can't get it. If you're in WinBugs, you can't get it. It's tough, right? Remel is just really hard to write. It's beautiful. It's, it's like if you're into like symbolic logic and the, the beauty of statistics, there's a paper in 1974 that's all three pages long that shows how to do it. It's just stacked with equations. Um, my uh, generalized linear mixed models course will actually start there next year, so we'll talk more about that. Um, but yeah, how do you fix it? Well, we need a better estimator. Where are our better estimators? We don't have them. This is one of those things where you say, yeah, we don't have them. 
Walt made a point in Ryan's defense about, and this is actually in the book, Walt's book I'm using next year, it talks about the, the impact of Remmel versus ML, and it's, it's quite large, it's quite substantial for him. Substantial, substantial for him. So. so this is one of those things where I'm just going to say, future research needed for psychometrics. But this is where, uh, if you wonder if psychometrics is evolving, it is, certainly. This is one of the things that we're doing. Uh, I'd like to work with Ryan. Actually, we're thinking about trying to put it in a grant where we propose to do this and try to get paid to do it. We'll see. It's kind of, it's, it's not as hard for some models, but it's really hard for others. Anyway, questions about Remmel versus ML? No. We'll see Remmel if you take multivariate with me, 905. Uh, we use Remmel in our estimation on everything, so we don't have to worry about that. Uh, but we don't get into factor models much, so we don't need to worry. We don't see this side of it. Okay. Uh, the next set. This is the, the the part of distribution model mis excuse me model misspecification model misspecification error. The first three types: dimensionality, constraints, and linear prediction function. All right. So this is when we're saying if you're using a sum score, those are sor maybe sources of error. They're not sources of error if you can get your model to fit in your measurement model. All right. So you get good model fit. We all know how to do model fit. Um, what did I call you, Jennifer? The uh, Arbiter of of model fit. <laughs> I, was, I think that's a you know nice gender neutral title. You know it's certainly um, czar. Yeah, I was trying to not go with anything you know Russian. I mean we're still in America here. No, sorry. <laughs> this is a, <we're> arbiters. <laughs> um, so these are things I'm lumping together because they all get fixed the same way. Uh, if you have good model fit, you have accurate results. Better type 1 error rate prevention in small sample sizes. Better type 2 error rate prevention. Everything's good, right? Uh, where would this be a problem? And so it's easy, relatively easy to find in normal, but where is it a problem? If you're using Bayesian methods, good luck finding model fit. If you're using non-normal data distributions, good luck finding model fit that's worth believing. Right? So it's tough. Um, in IRT, you'll see model fit, but the model fit metric relies on outputting a factor score. That's a problem. Because we outputted the factor score. What about the error that goes with it, right? So that's, that's kind of interesting. Did you talk about um, an IRT class this year, those of you who took it, uh, uh, model fit with the line and the dots and whatever, like X2, you know? Never mind. Never mind. Problem. So this one right here is relatively easy to get to take care of if you're in a normal world. <laughs> but who's normal, right? So um, it's, a, it's a big reason why I teach the class the way I do with normal, in part because everybody uses normal. Uh, and just like my son, I don't know that I b believe everything should be normal, right? So questions? All right, so that takes us to, let me just kind of cover it up. We've covered up to the end of this last, this part right here. We have two left, the data distribution, the factor distribution. And these ones are going to be relatively big question marks, right? Um, how do you figure out what's the right data distribution to use? Well, model fit that I've told you about is only true if the distribution is right, right? If, if you're truly have a multivariate normal distribution for your data and the factor distribution for that matter, then RMSEA, CFI, TLI, the likelihood ratio test, all that applies. Right? We forget, I mean I talk about it, I forget about it, but the reality of it is if your multivariate normal distribution doesn't fit, the likelihood ratio test is now invalid. <laughs> right? And that's the most powerful one we have. Whoa. How many of you believe that these data are normal? Exactly. All right? So all the stuff that we just talked about here to achieve model fit is under assumption that's tenuous at best, probably really unlikely. So how do you fix it? Well, you have to fit. This is where our model comparisons aren't good. We have to go outside of the distribution to compare it with other distributions with different, sorry, outside of a normal distribution, and then try out different distributions for the data to see which one fits better. The first step of that, trying out different distributions of the data, is exceedingly difficult. 
All right, if I were to take, let's take um, your last homework, the one that I still need to grade, um, where you have, how many factors did we estimate in homework five? Six plus a methods factor, seven. And that went, the estimation work, I mean, like once you got it to run, you get results pretty quick. If you took that seven factor thing and tried it with saying that your data are categorical, it might not be finished yet. Right? It takes that much time. We, the, 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 what we have to do to estimate it in terms of maximum likelihood, the likelihood function depends on the factors if we don't integrate them out. If we leave them in, then we get problems that our estimates aren't right. So we have to, for every step of the algorithm, do for every person, integrate out their factor score. We have to essentially do exactly what we're doing here, impute the factor score multiple times to make it work. Right? And that's just one type of distribution. What if, what if we could have done a count distribution? What if we had a skewed distribution? What, I mean, there's all sorts of ways. You could be chasing down distributions until, you know, you, you could just spend your career on one data set. It's very bad. Right now, this is where we need better science. But then, once if you word it, let's imagine, okay, that's fine. We made it so that you did that. You were insistent on it. You try it. Now what do you do? You have this two result from ML. You have a result from, like we'll call it the categorical version of ML. Categorical data, ML data, or multivariate normal data. How do you compare them? Well, the likelihood ratio test is no longer valid. Because the log likelihoods for different distributions follow different have different scales. Right? So there is uh, a test that people use in econometrics, uh, something called the Vuong test in uh, from a paper in 1989. Uh, that paper is really dense, but it's, it's a com it talks about compar model comparison of non-nested models, which is actually pretty cool. And these are non-nested models. Um, there's a paper on, how do you pronounce it, Ar 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 a R and what's X I V is that what Roman numeral is that I don't know anyway yeah maybe that's it it's a repository of open source papers it's kind of like where you put your paper if you want to have people read it while it's under review uh, so you can go to that website find the paper uh, they have a they have a nice package in R that does this uh, and we in theory could fit compare the fit of I R T or, or categorical versus normal, but we don't have the right inputs for it. <laughs> it's that hard to get to work. Uh, but this paper by Merkel, you, and Chris Preacher, who was a colleague of mine here and worked here for many years, um, very good very good researcher, uh, is one to look at for it. So what, are, what happens if you have the wrong model? Your factor score distributions, your factor scores themselves, they are not accurate, not accurate in the least. Right? They're not accurate for where the center of it is, and they're not accurate for where the variance of it is. Right? And so if you were to do, I, I tried this. I took, um, I took a very small example. I didn't include it in here because to get to it, it was hard to do, but I just was curious. What's the correlation, the multiply imputed correlation between a, fact, a sum score from a set of items and then the factor the imputed factor score from a distribution uh, when we treat the, the data as being truly categorical. That correlation was down like 0.6 that I found for this one example. All right, so that's telling you a lot of differences, right? Rather than 0.99 versus 0.998 or 0.97, all right, it's a, it could be a very big difference. To me, this is the biggest problem we face. This is the biggest source of misspecification error that we have, is model. And oh my goodness, there's no way to fix it. I've just said all of the stuff we do is crap. <laughs> so we should just go home. Maybe we just use some scores after all. No. Um, so that's, that's it. I think the thing is you have everything can be wrong with it. Um, the best you can do is try for multiple estimators. I would say that I think in a lot of people's minds what we do now is um, we take, if we have data that are categorical, even with Likert data, bless you, our ideal for it is to use the categorical estimator for it. So we just use the categorical estimator and assume it works better than normal and take the results from it. And I think that's probably a step in the right direction. It's probably closer to where we need it to be. Um, 
And therefore, for those of you who haven't taken Billy's badass IRT class, uh, there's a pitch for Billy's class right there. Uh, and that's actually something I very well believe too. I taught you all stuff that is tenuous at best. It kind of kills me to do that, but at the same time, I need we need to teach this class because you need people are using this type of research out there. Okay, um, good luck here. If you want to fix it, develop your own software. <laughs> that's basically it. Good luck, right? So put a so okay. So that's cool. We get to the last one. What about the factor distribution? There was a normal distribution we assumed about it, too. What if that's not the case? And I mentioned, I had this talk with Megan. If you, the talk was essentially on the premise. Would we, I, I, my research is on factors that aren't normal. And a lot of the questions I get, it's interesting, you know, when you get criticism of your research, it's kind of cool. One of the bigger topics are, you know, um, Nothing's not, everything's a continuum. There's no such thing as it. And so the question I tried to ask with this talk was, if we assumed, if we assumed that um, nothing was anything but, everything was continuous, could we even see if we had something that wasn't continuous? And the answer to this talk was no. If we assume it's a continuous factor, it's going to be a continuum. And it's going to change our results too. All right, so no wonder people say, well, yeah, we, of course everything's continuous. Because we never see anything that isn't. But you hear of methods out there. Uh, maybe you've heard of mixture models. Um, mixture models try to get latent variables that are classes. They're actually a, a nominal category of, vari of people. It's a, it's a multinomial distribution for a factor. Uh, my research fits into more of a, uh, a multinomial distribution, but with ordered factors themselves. Uh, but there are other factors we can do. This, this talk I gave, I was talking about, I gave this talk up at Wisconsin this summer, which was a lot of fun. Um, there, I'm going to show you some slides from it because it's an interesting thought experiment. But um, where do these distributions factor score? I, I, I asked Lisa, I said, hey, do you have any? She had this class uh, homework where people brought their own data for it. And so she went through her previous class of latent trait and gave, gave me some pictures of factor score distributions that she had people give. So this is the distribution of the factor score, the mean value for each person, right? And, and we're saying, hey, do we have any skewed distributions for it, right? Because we saw the gambling, right? Here's pathological gambling, here's more gambling, this is internal and external pain. That does not look normal. Uh, Hypermasculine posturing, I like that one. Um, maladaptive beliefs, uh, concussion symptom, of family identity salience. I mean, these are all factor scores from things that we see in surveys out there. Sex issues, that's a little bit more spread out. Um, here, here's an interesting thought, though, right? Is it a factor score or is it, um, is it our data, right? I mean, is it, where, where is it? Is it the data? Is it the factor? What's the thing that's not normal, right? Here, here's, our, here's gambling data. These are from items that you've seen in this class from the, the GRI. Uh, and here, if we, what if we had two, what if we had a factor that wasn't normal, but we had people who were either gamblers or not, or better yet, they could either meet a criterion or not, right? which is sort of what the, the DSM is built off of, but nobody believes the DSM, I hear, right? Still don't, right? It's not, not, haven't changed, that's good. Uh, I don't either, but if we were, you could think about how that would change things. Our measurement model might look a little different, right? We might have a measurement model that had a mean and a, a variance that might shift for each of these, right? Maybe people who had the fact, who didn't have the criterion had no variation, right? Oh, you don't have, you don't gamble, you don't gamble. There's no variance in not gambling, you just don't gamble, right? No is no. But if you do, there's a high variance, right? Maybe if you, yeah, okay, I feel high when I gamble. Yeah, there's some people who get really excited. That's what Vegas is all about, right? Come to Vegas, get excited. Right? And if it's not gambling, it's the fountains, or it's, you know, pick your Britney Spears show, or Cirque du Soleil, right? I mean, who knows what it is, right? Spent a lot of time in Vegas. Um, but there's a lot of variation in it, right? There's a lot of variation in getting feeling high when you gamble. So if we were to change that up, we might have a different factor score. Anyway, point being, I took a, did a little toy example, and I said, what if the truth was that factors were categorical and we had two values to them? What would the distribution do for it? This is just one simple example. I didn't, these were pretty solid factor loadings and everything, pretty good signal to it. The CFA, 
I did a thousand replications here and I had CFA fit that was almost perfect. RMSCA 0.019, uh, Arbiter of Model Fit, would you say that's pretty good? That's the highest out of 10,000 times I tried it. The highest, right? That's like the worst it got. And here's an example of the distribution, right? The, uh, the true distribution is on the top left. Once we put a factor on it, we've got a continuum. Now, it's a little bit of bimodal. There's a part to it, but this is an overwhelmingly positive version of how this would turn out. I could trick out the, fa the, the version of factor loadings, unique variances, and probably get the two to overlap pretty bit. So, so this last source of error is one that I'm kind of interested in. It's what I've sort of done my research on. What is the impact of not having a continuous factor or a, a normal factor distribution? Or better yet, what's the impact of assuming it? And then what's the impact of it on your data? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, yeah, these should be true, but we haven't really tried it. We don't know. How do we fix it? Develop our own software. How do we compare models? We need enough long tests. We don't have that yet. So what I'm trying to tell you is this is kind of the, the I'm trying to put in here the current edge of thinking of psychometrics, at least from the way I, my point of view of it. And the very beginning of that is the test score. The end of that is all the stuff that goes into it and what we know about and what we can fix. Questions on this? Anybody bothered by that? Of course. What bothers you most in this class? Normal distributions? Sum scores? I'll tell you what bothers you. Oh, good. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. All of what I, I mean, that's, that was the point where I, like, I think I need to just go back and think I'm not going to do this anymore. <laughs> I cannot ever know enough to do it at all. Exactly, yeah. It is It is tough where all the, to do it right, to do it well, is exceedingly difficult. It was like the moment I, I, when I was in fifth grade when I realized I could never read all the books in the library. <laughs> Well, I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. I have to tell you, I get to those moments too. I feel like, I think that for me, part of the problem is we did, I, I don't I don't know that I, whenever I'm reading this, there's all these sources, you know, points of view. And this might, mine's another point of view, but I was trying to put down where all these points of view are coming from. Where's the error coming from? How do we know how to treat each of them? I don't feel like we have a good analysis plan that would sort of attack each of these and be better at it. Or better yet, even what each matters for us. So, this is where it's neat to see ongoing research going on. And, and for me, that's what drives me, gets me out of bed in the morning, believe it or not. Error. Yeah, I agree. Other, other thought, what bothers you the most? What, what assumptions, let me maybe be more specific. What assumptions bother you the most in this, in this world? Normal? Model fit? Yeah, I don't know. It's a tough place. It's an interesting part of point of view. I'm hoping with these few final few lectures, it's kind of provoking some thought. This, to me, making this provoked a lot of thought. I could tell you how people do it. But I'd rather have you think about it a little bit more seriously than that. This is a, this is not an easy area. And, and the thing about it is, like, um, I always talk about my program. You know my position on your comps in my program, right, Ram students, right? We're asking you multiple choice questions. You know what good comps questions are, right? They're ones without answers, right? So multiple quote choice is out on that. <laughs> so now I think I just made it worse. <laughs> so how many of you want multiple choice quest if I, quest, questions if it, rather than a take home without an answer? I think the thing about it is this is where we don't have a lot of answers just yet. Even though it sounds like we do, and in practice, in research, people function like we have a lot of answers. I think it's important to be critical of it to see where it matters. Right. There's, there's got to be some blend of it. I think there's some truth to what we're doing, and certainly the best that we can do, uh, tackling measurement error and understanding where the sources of variation is, are, is the best we can do, or no, that's fine. We can't create software to do this. There's not a lot of people who can, and even if we could, now we've got, <laughs> I know with my software, we have Templin error, right? <laughs> it's, which is every keystroke, there's a probability, a non-zero probability, I'm going to make something wrong, right? Heck, with this lecture, I didn't put that on there. There's a meta, meta message for it, too, right? 
so it's it's tough like you can get into the the woods of how do you how do you do it the best way possible and then you're like well i still have to get something done and i don't know i've never resolved that either that's where a lot of sources of frustration are in my world like i look at the testing world and i think oh we take such liberties with data but then i realize yeah how how, how can we make it better Anyone want to add to that? I'm trying to have a neat little conversation. You add to it, but I'm hungry or I need to go. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm done with this lecture. This was sort of um, where we get to. I have a couple neat things to talk about. One of the things that drives me is uh, like this ETS guide to test scores in, uh, in the GRE. This is where I remember, remember I showed you the GRE range, the slide that Lisa had made a couple of years ago. Let's see if I have it here. This this ETS, um, tell me it's not going to load. This ETS test score guide is, uh, is interesting because you'll see how they go and report their reliability now. And they use methodology that's, uh, oh, I can't, I can't do that. Never mind. There we go. Okay, anyway, so take a look at it. It's kind of interesting. The methodology they use for it is with simulation. And they report some pretty low reliabilities, even with simulation. So it's pretty interesting how that works. Another thing interesting, um, there's a good blog. Uh, there's a statistician, political scientist named Andrew Gelman. He's a blog. Uh, he's at Columbia. And uh, they ha he has this thing he gets on, which is something called p-hacking. I can't open it because I haven't agreed to Adobe's user license in this I have on this computer, but not in this account. So, um, it talks about uh, he he talks about the garden of forking paths, or this idea of what happens when you're chasing noise, right? So if you get an, a p value less than 0.05, and then all of a sudden you shift shift your resources and your research on that, and you get the next one, and you start circling. Eventually, you start circling around or whatever else. And so it's how do you? The paper is about multiple comparisons in like a NOVA, you know, the idea of that. But the idea is still the same. It's the working up until you get your p-value less than 0.05. And actually, I think his argument, he's a Bayesian statistician. His argument is we shouldn't have p-values in the first place. More Bayesian statistics or Bayesian evidence for it, which is a pretty cool argument. But uh, just things to think about if you're interested. For next week, our last class, uh, which is awesome. Thank you for making it this far. I, I'm going to present to you, I, I've been debating how I'm going to do it. We've had to knock off several topics this year, partially due to absences on my part, partially due to me talking too much. Um, I'm torn between presenting one final topic, which is measurement and variance, or DIFF, from uh, the CFA perspective in its entirety, or sampling from several of the topics left off, which would be measurement and variance, um, and then, uh, well, Quite frankly, the uh, what happens when we don't have normal distributions uh, for data, and maybe a little bit for factors. Do you have a take on that? Do you? Think, I mean, I don't want to. I know if I open it up to everybody, then everybody's going to. Well, uh, someone I didn't agree with so and so, but do you have any input? I would like to hear your input. I, I'm ultimately the arbiter of decision. I have to. I have to make a decision. But uh, do you have any thoughts? Each one is sort of in really important, and we could spend probably three weeks on each topic, if not a whole semester on each. Um, anybody? Diff is very helpful, absolutely. I was thinking about taking half of the class on diff and taking more of the perspective of what how it works and then kind of giving you examples that actually I borrow. Lisa has a great example on this, and so I'm going to give her credit and borrow her slide. I don't know that I could ever do better than it. And there are actually other people teaching from her slides. So it's like, well, you know, I'll just go ahead and say, yeah, I took this from her. Um, the other part to that is uh, I do think having a little bit, I want you in IRT, those of you in my program, to see the connection to item response theory, things that go on in the world. Because I, wanna, I want you to think you could be doing, even though you switch to IRT and everybody focuses on a little bit different things, I want you to also think simultaneous analysis could be possible there too. We just don't ever do it. So I, I, I want. I feel like both are equally important. So does that sound like an okay strategy? Kind of half and half. Cool. All right. And maybe I'll bring pizza. Does that sound good? I'm just going to openly bribe you. And my bribe is not this. I don't want you to rate me higher than you normally would. But on the back, I want you to give me your opinion. 
and I'll give you a couple questions. If you'll write your opinion on and tell me how to make it better, I will. And maybe if you really are want to make me happy, put a few four-letter words in there. So that would be awesome. All right, I'm going to stop here. Thanks, everybody.